So tonight we're um, starting a, a sermon series, a three-week series on what, well, I'm calling it the story of two sons and their father. Um, you have probably heard this parable called something different. There are lots of names for it. Most often it's just called the prodigal son. And the reason that I'm not calling the series that is because, um, well, there's two other characters in this story. <laughs> And I want us to think deeply and seriously about what Jesus is telling us about this. Um, and so we're going to explore the story of two sons and their father over the next few weeks. Um, this is actually, if you read uh, the 15th chapter of Luke, is actually the third of three stories that Jesus tells to describe to several listeners the unique and unfamiliar love of God. Um, and then this story, which again is most often called the prodigal son, because that is, he is the, the more popular character in some regards, um, is, is one of those stories, one of the ways that Jesus does that. And prodigal, and I want to just say right up front, because this is who we're going to talk about tonight, is this younger son, the prodigal son. Prodigal just means someone who is wasteful, someone who lives a life of extreme extravagance. And that's who we're going to think about tonight, specifically his story that Jesus tells. Because as he introduces us to this father and his two sons, that this, this younger son, this prodigal son, uh, very quickly embarks on a journey that reveals to all of Jesus' listeners then and now a deeply selfish way of life. And then when Jesus begins the parable, we see that happening just almost immediately as the, the younger son goes to his father and asks for his share of the property, which without a recorded word in reply, the father gives him. And then just a few days later, the son departs. And when you think about what just happened, it's, it's actually kind of weird that it happens so fast and without some kind of argument or pushback. I mean, the younger son asks him, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. And when he asks that, this is not a son going to his father asking for his allowance or to his employer for his salary. He is asking for his inheritance, and think about that for a second. He is, he is asking from his father for his father's property, for what would normally be given to him after his father has died. And so from the very start, what the son is doing must have been deeply hurtful and offensive to his father and to really to all of his family. The younger son is essentially declaring that the only thing he wants from them, the only thing he wants from his father, is what he would normally receive as his inheritance. But he wants it now. He wants to take half of his father's property and his father's right to use it while he is still very much alive or really, to put it another way, what the son is saying is that the only value he sees in his family or in his father is what they will give him in money and property. That to him, it would be better off if his father was, was dead. And so then, after this decidedly uncomfortable family situation... When the younger son has received his half of the inheritance, he leaves for a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. And let's be clear, this is, a, this is not what you might think about. Leaving for a different country is not, it's not a, a distant relative who wants to go find themselves by backpacking Europe. This is, this is very different the younger son isn't trying to go see the world while he's got some money in his pocket and some time to spare. Let's not dismiss those first steps of the story as something so simple. And of course, we know the end of the story. We know that there will soon be a homecoming. But I think it's important for us to note that the parable doesn't begin with the son in the distant country. The parable begins with him at home. That he is there, 
living with his family, living with his loving father, and the first thing the son does is chooses to leave. The younger son rejects his father, and and he asks for his inheritance. He rejects his home, the traditions of his family and the community, and he leaves. And I wonder, what is it what is it to leave like that? What is it to leave in that way? To disown your father and your family and to just completely disconnect. To say, it would be better if you were just dead and I had what was coming to me. To make that kind of intense separation. To cut yourself away from the living and acting and thinking that has been handed down to you from your family. To not just disrespect, but in fact to betray where you are and and who you are. And of course, there I'm intentionally saying you as much as I might intentionally say me because remember, this is a a parable that Jesus told. It's not simply a a once-upon-a-time story to entertain us, but is in fact how Jesus challenges us and invites us to consider the times that each of us leaves home because we too belong to God. We live in a place where we can hear God's voice. And, and, and there are times when, when we begin to reject that home and we begin to venture out onto our own and to carve our own path to make our own way. And with that in mind, of course, it's, it's easy to be dismissive of both the younger son, and of the times that we've done similarly, um, because it seems in part, really just seems kind of an unbelievable choice to make. Why, Why would the son leave the place where he is loved? Why would we leave the place where we are loved? And maybe, maybe none of us have gotten to the point where we have consciously gone to the father and said, you know, you are, are dead to me. Give me what would be mine if that was actually so. But when we find ourselves venturing out, we can become deaf to the words of the Father as we distance ourselves from them. We can travel to places that are so far away, so different, that they might as well just be distant countries and begin to ignore the calls of the one who calls us beloved. And instead, we just, we take the money and run. And we do that in part, I think, because God's voice is not the only voice we have in our ears. There are a lot of other voices that compete And they sometimes sound deceptively familiar to the Father's voice. Voices that that tell us to to prove ourselves, to to make it on our own. Voices that, that suggest we don't need the support of the Father after all. That we really can have the more helpful love of the world. Voices that deny the love of the Father, desperately trying to convince us that the the love that we know from Him, that we remember from Him, an unconditional and unending love, that that couldn't possibly be a, a free gift. And so instead, the voices invite us to something different, invite us to, to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And that's, that sounds exciting. In fact, it sounds kind of heroic. The voices whisper to us that it's success, really. Success is what defines us, and that sounds fair, maybe even even doable. The voices suggest to us that, that we're judged by our connections and the company we keep, and that just sounds reasonable. The voices encourage us to, to never, never show weakness, and of course that just sounds rational, right? These are, these are enticing Voices And they're ones that, that tell us that we are better than others, that we can do it on our own. These are the voices of the world that call us away from our Father's house. And then that promise us acceptance and happiness and privilege. But, but the thing is, the world's love, those voices, it's so chock full of ifs. <laughs> if only, if that, that they are always conditional. And a love that is conditional, 
Love that that is contingent on you or me being a certain way first or that requires us to succeed in order to earn it or especially at the expense of others or insists on some kind of performance. That's not a love that sets us free. That's a love that enslaves us. And even when such a love is well-intentioned, and let's be sure, a lot of the world's love is well-intentioned, it just pales in comparison to the Father's love especially as it beckons us away from it. My friends, I want to suggest that we, each of us, leave home for our own version of a distant country every time we follow those voices and those promises that are offering us ways to earn whatever we desire. We leave home when we prefer to to hear acceptance through what we've acquired or achieved instead of hearing the voice of the Father say to us, you are my beloved child. And those are the times when we accept something else, even, even seek something else. When we have become the younger son, prodigal or otherwise, and we find ourselves moving deeper and deeper into the distant country. And the thing is, the Father, the Father will let this happen for us just as, as he did for the younger son. God never withholds his blessing or pulls away. God doesn't do that, but the Father, the father never stops considering his son his beloved. But because he loves him, the Father also can't force his son to stay home. Couldn't force his son to not have the freedom to make that choice. And even though he knew that there would be a great deal of pain for them both when he let him go. And painful though it was, and painful as it is for us, that that too is how God's love works. When we're allowed to find our own lives, even at the risk of losing them, we are loved so deeply by God that God sets us free and lets us be free, even free to leave home free to go so far that we can't any longer hear our Father's voice. Because just as the, as the younger son's story begins at home, our story begins there too. The blessing of God's love is with us from the beginning and it defines who we are. We are the ones who move away from it again and again. And, that, and yet the Father finds his place again and again, standing and waiting always watching for us to return, ready to embrace us, ready to welcome us home. But anyways, back to our parable where we find the younger son in that distant country. He's removed himself from that love. He's squandered his inheritance by dissolute living. That's a word we need to bring back, by the way, dissolute. That's just a good word. But he's working this difficult, demeaning, unappreciated job. And no one where he finds himself would would give him anything to eat. And in fact, he is so distraught and so hungry that he says to himself he would be fine sharing the disgusting food that he is feeding to the pigs. It seems the love of the world, conditional as ever, has ceased to have any interest in him now that he has nothing to give back in return or in payment. And in that moment, that devastating moment, as he labors, as he is starving, he finally remembers the voice of his father. He remembers his home, remembers that he is someone's son, And he even dares to remember being called beloved. And he resolves to return home. And then here, (laughs) the actions that the son takes in that moment feel very familiar to me. Because once he has decided to return home, he also realizes that, that doing so... Doing so is probably going to be a very embarrassing experience. Remember how he left 
Remember how he has lived, and to go home is going to be embarrassing, to say the least. And so he writes and begins to practice a speech. (laughs) He says, I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And having crafted that much of it, he starts on his way. But, but again, I want to just slow down and consider, who is that speech for? Who, who is he writing that for? The younger son has been called home because he remembers that he is his father's son, but he also feels this intense need to provide an explanation. He has lived for so far in that distant country among only the conditional love of the world that he believes his only place at home must be as a hired hand. And he's willing to do that just to be home again, but he believes that's the only place he is worthy to hold in his home. The son's rehearsed speech admits his guilt, but it also assumes punishment. He believes that somehow the father will still love him, but that that love will be lesser, will be reduced And that it will maybe only be on the condition of hard labor. That he would now be reduced to staff, a hired hand. He believes that he deserves nothing more than that because, well, because he's been taught that's the truth of things, right? That's the way the world really works. And that's a lesson that he didn't learn at home. It's not something he was taught by his father, but by that conditional love of the world that he has lived amongst. And we we could very easily find ourselves in the same position when we recall God's voice and we decide to turn back and decide to return home. We rehearse our own versions of speech, our own prayers. And we say, you know, God, I couldn't make it on my own. I'm not even entirely sure why I tried to again. And now you are the only resource left to me. I beg your forgiveness and I hope for minimal punishment. Let me survive, if only on the condition of a more difficult life, which I admit that I have earned through my sin. I mean, that's a prayer that kind of feels familiar to me. In fact, in a lot of ways, it feels fair, at least in a, in a system of, of conditions, of conditional love. But the thing is, that's a speech for a harsh and judgmental God. That's a, that's a prayer for a God who makes and works for us to feel guilty, wants us to feel worried, wants us to feel like a failure, wants us twisted up in those kinds of self-serving apologies and resentment. Submission to that God, it doesn't lead to freedom. It only leads to more bitterness and more resentment. And more importantly... That kind of prayer is for a God that is not anywhere close to the God that Jesus describes for us in this parable. Because in this parable, when the the prodigal son returns and the father sees him from far off, the father runs to him, wraps his arms around him, and kisses him. And that rehearsed speech, the one the son has all ready to go, to admit his guilt and take his well-earned punishment and his new lowly station. The father wants nothing to do with it. But instead, finally speaking his first words in the story, the father interrupts his speech. He cuts it short. And he doesn't do that with what we might expect. He doesn't say, how dare you? (laughs) He doesn't say, you have got a whole lot of work to do to regain my love and my trust. But instead, what he says is, put the best robe on my son. Put a ring on him. Put new sandals on him. And let's celebrate. Let's throw a party. Because this son of mine was dead, but here he is, alive again. He is home. He was lost and is found. The father interrupts that rehearsed speech because because he's not so interested in what has separated them. What he celebrates 
is only that his son, his beloved son, has returned home. And praise God, because that's, that's what it is for us, too. Because when God created humankind right from the beginning, God saw that it was very good. And despite whatever conditional love or dark voices draw us away from God's voice, there is nothing that any of us can do to ever change that. We are God's children, and we can always return home to our Father, who will see us from far off, who will run to meet us, And we'll start the party simply because we have come home. Because we are his beloved. Thanks be to God. Amen.